Hi guys. So uh, this is Jeff here. So here's the thing. This is what happened. We had a, we had a great show this week. Uh, we're really excited. We actually have author Nylon McBain on with us. But we had a little bit of a snafu where near the end uh, audio crashed, particularly on Nylon's end. So uh, we, this is why we're so delayed. So we've spent some time restitching it together. This took a number of hours of basically piecemealing a couple thousand files, so everything made sense. Uh, so the point is, on Nylon's feed, you might hear some popping, some some clicking, and this and that, and that's a result of what we had to do. And also, we weren't able to recover about her last 10 to 14 minutes of uh, of audio, and so that being the case, we had to uh, shorten the show a little bit, try to make it make sense where it did, and there might be some points where it's clear that we're kind of saying, like, yeah, Nylon, and then there's just dead air, and it moves on because there was no other way to edit it. So that being the case... Thanks for bearing with us. We hope you'll enjoy this week's show. We're sorry again for the delay and uh, and sorry for the sort of lower grade quality. But without further ado, we give you one of our, our better shows in a long time. So please enjoy. Thanks again. Hi, everybody. It's time for This Week in Mormons, your Mormon news, culture, podcast thing. Here we are. Things are happening. I'm excited to be here. It's another great week. It's a beautiful evening here in D.C. I'm looking at the Washington Monument, thinking about how blessed I am. It's a terrific time. Jeff, Jeff's turn for the four-minute diatribe. Everybody go silent. Let him run. Let him go. Don't let me talk. Otherwise, it gets really, really boring. And next thing you know, I'll spend the entire time talking about the Scottish referendum tomorrow, which is pretty much all I care about. Are you Wait, are you excited about that? Al, I went to grad school in Edinburgh. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, but they're cared for by the queen. And I feel like that's the way they like. They still well, want to be cared for by the queen. We can talk my about la- this all night. My last name is McBain. I might be. I might be most. Uh, I might have the the say the the biggest say here, even though I've never and, I've never I've never lived there. I've been there. That's a and fair your point. first I, name I, is Nylon. I feel like you could be a Highlander. Yes, exactly. <laughs> my father was buried in his kilt. How about that? <laughs> when you meet another oh, McBain, you have to kill one another. <laughs> there can be only one. <laughs> You love Highlander references lately. I don't know. I why. love Highlander. I I <laughs> I was the twelve year old that had a duster and thought I was really anyway. Really cool. Um, I don't want to be rude. Before I could, I can talk about the referendum all day long. But that voice you hear, everyone, is Nylon McBain, <laughs> famed <laughs> author, wonderful person, is joining us this week. So we should all just yes, oh, thank you. bravo. I don't. I don't have a Scottish brogue to offer you. I'm sorry. Well, that's okay. <laughs> the tradition would have. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, no, we're, we're very excited to have, have you on. We're excited to bring our TWIM audience uh, a woman's perspective on things, which normally is Jeff's job, and he does a very good job. Very of it. true. Thank but, you. But now, Nylon will, uh, will be hanging out with us for the evening, so we're excited. Uh, you want to take just a minute and introduce yourself, sort of tell everybody what, uh, I don't know, couple, do, the, do the weird thing we make people do when they're visiting in, re, in like Relief Society or Elders Quorum. And introduce yourself. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Well, you all now know that I have Scotch-Irish heritage, and thus my strange name, which you guys have done a very good job of pronouncing well so far this evening. So thank you. That's thank always you. A, thank you. That's always meaningful. I, I to actually me. wrote it out phonetically <laughs> on a little <laughs> tab for it. So it, <laughs> you can just keep saying hi, hi, nai, hi, nai, but don't say no. hey, nay, because then you'll get confused. Hey, Naylin is not right. So now that I've probably oh. confused you even more. Oh, I see Hi, Ni- Hi Nyland. Everything's yeah. ruined. We're yeah. all undone. <laughs> oh, so let's see. About me, I um, I currently live in Salt Lake City. I've lived here for five years. It's a great place. We really love it. We actually moved here from um, Brooklyn, and I was born and raised in Manhattan and have also lived in San Francisco and Boston. So people didn't think I was going to love Salt Lake when we moved here. Um, but it's ended up oh. being terrific, and it's this is the first house I've ever lived in. I lived in apartments until five years ago, and apartments are overrated. But Salt Lake. I is... disagree. I disagree. Apart? Did I say apartments? I said I mean houses. Oh, houses. Okay. okay. Houses Ooh. are overrated. No, I'm sure you guys wait will a minute me on that. How can they houses be houses are overrated? But Salt Lake City is not. So. Do you, does it now have have you ever been to Saturday's Waffle at Olympus Hills? <laughs> Definitely, my kids beg to go every week. Yes, yes, I've I go every Saturday. I've been there since almost a year and a half ago. Oh, really? I'm a staunch supporter of those guys. What well, this is amazing. Go? 
Mike and Rick are amazing. I well, sometimes I'll go like normally about nine o'clock. If you've seen a huge guy that you were maybe a little afraid of, that was probably me. Oh, yeah. The island is I'm no. the six foot seven yeah. bearded Missourian. Wait, are you serious? Are you six foot seven? Yeah, he's a monster. Yeah, I'm huge. Oh, I this is, wow. This is my real life. The, I have the a struggle brother. Is no, real. I have a brother in law who's six foot seven. My my husband is six four and he's the smallest in his family, so poor guy. He's yeah. the six four midget. I, love, I will look for I love you. That. I will look. Well, for you. this is <laughs> when, nice. When I, I'm only six two, so I'm feeling inadequate in this discussion. <laughs> this is not fun for me. Well, I was. I'm. I'm. I'm called the shrimp of the family, and I'm an embarrassment to the genes. And I'm. I'm five seven. So <laughs> you're ruining football. I'm ruining. Careers, yeah, I am. <laughs> or basketball careers. Oh, yes. Well, I'm good. Well, we've established that that Al and Nyland can can meet up at Saturday's waffle sometime, <laughs> and that's good. It's. I've been there as well. We'll be tall people record. together. For the record, I've also been there. It's so good, man. The peach cobbler waffle Al, we, mm, with the with the peach and a little pecan praline. Ooh, so good. We actually had a mission. Wait, to, so so. Uh, oh, go ahead, Al. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. Oh, I was no, just gonna say can. we had a mission to get them to name a waffle after you, but I don't think it's happened yet. No, they would. I just don't have a clever recipe. Okay, fair enough. I like the I like the pear and gorgonzola one they had a few weeks ago. Oh that! Oh my God! You would think so they're good. sponsoring if you ever get the, the chance, show. If you ever get the chance, go and get the Walking Shaw. That's a real. That's a real waffle named after a uh, a good friend of mine who I'm very jealous of. But it's raspberries, blackberries, speculose, and whipped cream. That sounds Just, great. Mm, mm. All right, this is our gastronomical journey through Mormondom. <laughs> it's also dine around right now, Jeff, which I'm sure you're missing. I I love dine around. Dine around for those of you that aren't savvy. Is, is that like Salt restaurant week or something like that? Where all the restaurants come up with a menu that you get for like, it's like $15 for a dinner or something. They do and like a fixed to, pre-menu. Yeah, yeah I'm, like I'll go to Ruth's Chris and get a meal for 15 bucks. I've never been to Ruth's Chris because I'm too cheap. And now I'll actually go be able to try fine foods and not break the bank. It's, it's actually a really cool idea. So there's like 30 restaurants participating. That's good. So, Nylon, you moved to Utah and you live in a Jeff, house. aren't you curious what I ate tonight? <laughs> we had mac and cheese tonight for dinner, if anyone's curious about that. Was it, I had, but was it was homemade? Three little, three little was, people at home. Was it was like, not homemade. It was even made in the microwave. <laughs> it was really gross. <laughs> Wait, you make mac and cheese in the microwave? I did, Aww. but I also made salmon and a, and a bulgur and sal- a spinach salad for me and my husband. So, we, you know, it balanced. Because oh, why do kids need kids. to be healthy? That's, kids don't need to yeah. be healthy. No. <laughs> the Give last them a people Coke on and a earth tub of licorice and we'll, call, we'll call it a night. The kids just want to eat sugar anyway. That's all that matters. Yep. Well, so is, isn't it true, Nylon? you've written a book of some sort? I yeah? have. I'm so glad we're, <laughs> we're bringing the conversation <laughs> around to that. Isn't it true? <laughs> Yes, I've written a book, and um, I went and I saw it in person on the shelves of Deseret Bookstore yesterday, so that was kind of an exciting moment. I was actually going to ask you if Deseret Book carried it, because I didn't know if it would be kind of too, not exactly did in I get, wheelhouse. Did I get but... the imprimatur of the, yes, I did. Yeah, wow, it's, good for you. It's being carried in um, both online and in the stores, and it's am- at Amazon and also through the publisher's website, Coford Books. Have we named the Are book you? yet? Is there a name to this mysterious novel? <laughs> It is called Women at Church, Magnifying LDS Women's Local Impact. Were you afraid of having a title that was too short? Women at Church? <laughs> no, I like long titles. I've I'm it's a fault. <laughs> I well, liked It's a brilliant I feel like I get the whole synopsis of the book just out of the Well, I feel like, it's, I like a, it. it's a brilliant title from an SEO perspective. I mean, it really covers all the bases <laughs> you of pack being it all in there. You do. There's nothing I mean, ambiguous. I got Kate Mor- Kelly. Mormon in there. Mormon in there somewhere too, but I think we could probably figure that out. If you could have worked in the year of Kate Kelly in a subheading, <laughs> it would have been golden. The year of Kate Kelly. Oh dear. No, no, no. Well, but, so Anyways, I've uh, I've I've had the pleasure of reading your book actually, so we're glad you're here to talk about it. And uh, thanks. Yeah, well, it's good. I think there's, I mean, there's so much to talk about. If you want to that's, talk about, that's just that's just diagnosis. It's good. <laughs> it's good. It's, it's going good. to be good. Um, no, I thought this was a great book, and we'll actually have a review up over at thisweekinmormons.com for folks who want to read something more in depth. But what I liked about this, and uh, Nyla, when I, when I first ever was aware of you, especially with a lot of the stuff that's gone on this year, um. I feel like you bring 
and you can of course refute this, but you bring, it seems like a pragmatic approach to real issues. I don't know if that's how you would describe your agenda or whatever. It's very easy because we see so, especially in the blogosphere, we see so many potentially, you know, radical ideas and a lot of bitterness, a lot of anger, a lot of people running off of the mouth on social media. But I liked reading this book because it seemed like it was written from the approach of like, there are sensible solutions we can put in place that aren't, these aren't a panacea, but it's something that we can do that actually is workable within the current confines of the church. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's accurate. So what was your impetus for, for writing this? What's, tell us all about yeah. the history of the book. Books, and I know you books do are the, hard. Let's not yeah. kid ourselves. Why would you write a book? <laughs> what, what did you say? Like, like why, why write a book? Jeff and I have been, we've been working on a book for years. It's very hard to write a book. Because Colford Books asked me to do it. That was why I did it. Um, I mean, honestly, like the whole, the whole pragmatic approach, um, I think it really just stems from a um, really an early understanding as far back as I can remember growing up in New York City, which in the 80s and early 90s was kind of a very exotic, faraway place for the church. Um, <laughs> and it's all, you know, I, I, I kind of think it might be like growing up abroad in the church today internationally it was a it was very disconnected from salt lake i mean i remember we went and we watched general conference in the cultural hall twice a year but the experience that i had growing up was almost completely um shaped by local leaders and local experiences and um i think i just really kind of gained this 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 very um solid separation in my mind between what I benefited from uh, in the gospel and what I benefited from from the local experience and then what was overlaid uh, from the institutional uh, Salt Lake um, experience. And those things were always very separate for me. And so I think it really helps me able, it, it enables me to sort of approach uh, an issue like women at church a little bit more dispassionately and say, okay, well, you know, I'm going to start from a place from assuming that the gospel is really something that brings some of my greatest joy. And uh, so how can I work from that place and still very pragmatically address some of the tensions that uh, make some of our women uncomfortable? So, so I... So do you feel, do you feel like um, maybe a lot of the, uh, I, guess, I guess the struggles that we have understanding some of the women's issues in the church or, or figuring out what to do next or how to how to sort of battle for some of these um different issues does that stem from from more of the the utah culture is that something that you're like are you suggesting that it's sort of more the the mormon culture and not the mormon doctrine that's causing a lot of these struggles well i uh you know there are definitely struggles uh th some of the struggles are very unique to my five years of living here in utah uh and you know going to church in san francisco and going to church in boston I wouldn't say that those places were immune, and certainly uh, what, going what to kind of what kind of struggles do you, are would be unique to Utah? Um, well, in those other places, there's this sense that you know your ward is really a lifeline, right? I mean, if you're if you're going to school in Connecticut, college like in Connecticut, like I was, I went to Yale. Like the 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 ward there was really just this sense of coming home. It provided this sense of of family and this sense of sort of relief at the end of a week, right? And, sure, and yeah. um, I grew up with that and I had that through my adult life until I moved here. And now I'm one of those people who has her mom and her, you know, living down the street from her. And so the Ward family isn't, isn't needed as much anymore. I have a lot of great friends here who are members of the church who kind of fill that 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 social and spiritual need of you know being of community, and so when I go to church on Sunday, it's just a very different uh, a, a very different need that it's filling. It's really a very pragmatic need. I go to take the sacrament and renew my covenants and sort of be part of a community because that's what I um, feel sure. religion is important for. But it's not that complete you know social and spiritual lifeline it was as it was in other places. And so I think that tends to breed. Um, it makes it a little bit more difficult to feel that that unity in your ward because in those other places I've been I've been everybody's so excited to get there on Sunday and you make friends with each other, you know, in 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 really sincere ways. Um, a lot of times uh, in urban wards, at least, you're you're in similar places in your life. 
um, and so you have things in common. Or, huh. um, you know, in my ward here, again, it's very dis diverse demographically. Um, we're really dispersed in terms of what place in life we are. And there, and so it bring, makes it harder to sort of create that mini Zion community like each ward should be. That's, that's interesting. I've actually observed that for a long time. That I, for, for me personally, I feel like it's a lot harder for me to be uh, a, a good Mormon or what I deem a good Mormon here in Utah versus when I'm living in other places. Uh, primarily because like in, in other places, just that you, you cling to that, uh, that little bit of familiarity, that, that faith, that home, that culture, yeah. Yeah. uh, as much as you can. And then when you're here, it's like, oh yeah, yeah. And then I got this thing that I'm supposed to go to. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I just think that that makes it, it, it makes it a little bit harder to be sympathetic to the needs of the ward here it makes it harder to feel comfortable expressing your needs as a member of the ward. Um, and it, I think it also, for some reason, makes it a little bit more difficult for wards to sort of think imaginatively and creatively about how to solve the needs of their ward members. Okay. Well, so, so uh, and I apologize, Jeff, Jeff got the advanced copy. I, I did not. But uh, are there are there like specific issues that you're trying to address in the in the book or is it just sort of in no, general? No, there, there are no issues in the book, Al. It's just... <laughs> like, oh, I got... <laughs> What are well, what are you tackling? So, well, let me let me start with who the audience is, because um, the audience, uh, um, I, th I found that this was one thing that really needed to be cleared up initially for people who hadn't read the book yet. I make it very clear in the very beginning of the book, I think, what the book is and what it isn't and who the audience is. But uh, I believe those, those words are the... actually uttered, by the way. It says what this book is and what this book isn't. So yeah, <laughs> it's very direct. <laughs> it is. Yeah, I, 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 it's very important to me. So um, uh so the the book is intended to be uh, a, a call for empathy, really. And the way I do that is I try to explain why some women at church today feel a tension between what they're living in their church experience and what they're experiencing out in their lived world experience. And I and essentially the foundational thesis is that the that the church institution is the only institution where modern 21st century American women are introduced to the idea of separate spheres for genders, that something is off limits to them because they are women. That concept is really almost extinct in modern American institutions, right? And so, yeah, not, so for my daughters even, not only um, is that the only place that they are being told, you know, empirically that something, something is off limits to them, it's actually being introduced to them there that this idea that because they are girls, they have a special role, with specific responsibilities, and also that some things are off limits to them. So that's really the first time in our history where where the lived experience hasn't shared something of that in common with um, the, the the church experience. And so part of it is to just to you know encourage empathy for people that are feeling. That tension, and I, 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 I outline six similar reasons for why those tensions might exist. And then the second part of the book, the second half of the book, or actually the second two thirds of the book, I should say, uh, is really sort of a, an, an exercise in problem solving and, a, and creatively looking at ways within the current guidelines of the handbook that we can sort of alleviate some of those tensions in the church experience and in the two, in the institutional uh, church experience. And those include ways that we can see and hear and include uh, women more thoroughly in church administration, all of which are just sort of reading between the lines of the handbook and looking at creative ways that we can take what's in the handbook and just play with it. So you really want a second counselor to be a woman in the bishopric? Is that right? <laughs> I don't say that. I do I say, however, I, I, do have a, I do have a Message great... Message received. I do have a great story, though, of um, a woman... Uh, actually, it was a, in a singles ward who was put over... Uh, who was made responsible for all of the Sunday programming. And she shares her story in the book. I, I interviewed uh, about 130 different people both in person and via email, and collected their stories. And one of those stories is from this girl who was uh, the, I don't remember what they called her, I think the program coordinator in her in her ward. And she loved that calling, and she worked with the bishop, and she describes in her little narrative about how, we you know, the impact that that calling had on her. So that's this call. And, and we also describe, um, a number of people also described to me the idea of women's councils, 
uh, and kind of in, in uh, innovative ways that they're working with their bishoprics. One thing that I thought was interesting in reading it was that um, it seemed that this is one I've thought about a lot of the women's issues, you know, that, that go on. But one thing I didn't think about as much was that a lot of women professed that they uh, like that they didn't feel like they had. How would you describe it? You know, scriptural authority in a way. I think there was a section where you sort of mentioned how women felt awkward closing out a sacrament meeting or doing things. I think there was that one where a stake president got because a woman like apologized up front, yeah. like, "Oh, I'm a woman closing a sacrament meeting." Um, and then a stake president got up and actually said, like, you know, thankfully he got up and said, hey, it's my job as a stake president to correct uh, stuff from the pulpit if needs be. And it's like, it's OK. Women can close a sacrament meeting. And I've yeah. and, and that still baffles me. I mean, thankfully, I've been in pretty, I think, pretty reasonable wards my whole life. Whether I grew up in Southern California or living out here or wherever else I've been. Um, where women have been reasonably involved and I've never felt like there's been that, that sort of mentality of no women can't pray to close a sacrament meeting or women can't be mm -hmm. the final speakers. And it's, mm -hmm. and it really baffles me. And I think it is probably more of an American uh, problem than it is internationally. Uh, but, uh, do, do you the, think does, ahead, like, does the, does the attitude lie more in the women or in the men? Is it, is it something that you're <laughs> trying to address in, in like women, you know, be a little more bold or men quit being schmucks? <laughs> <laughs> there's a little of there's a little of both of that, and I say I say in the book like uh, almost every man I interviewed uh, said that he it expressed some sort of story where he, as a bishop, had invited a Relief Society president to attend the PEC meetings, and she had declined. Um, and and I I try and wrestle with that a little bit in the book. It's a very complicated complicated question. Um, why why would a woman decline to be more involved uh, or you know, and, and, and sometimes it's not necessarily because she doesn't feel bold or doesn't feel powerful. Sometimes it's because she feels like she can get more done on the sidelines working sort of on her own with her own group than she does, you know, sitting I know through, I feel that way through, through, through yet another <laughs> meeting. It's, yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of that. So, so one of the conclusions I came to is that sort of it, it's very rare to find a woman who isn't necessarily negotiating for power at all. And by power, I mean like a sense of being heard and being involved, right? But, but a lot of women do negotiate for power within a safe environment, with an environment that they feel is approved and that they have exercised that power in previously, where they feel very comfortable and at home. And so sometimes I think it can be, you know, just subconsciously, of course, but it can be perceived when a woman is invited to participate in a larger sphere as a little bit, um, you know, a little bit uncomfortable. It's outside of her, her comfort level and a little, uh, and, and so the, 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 reaction might be to decline that. But I think that there are a lot of reasons. And, and I mean, that is a fascinating topic and one that I, I think I've just probably just uh, touched the surface of. Yeah, it's, it, well, I mean, a lot of, like, outside of just the uh, the bishop and the, the, the woman uh, working this out, you have the entire culture of the church that's looking at them and saying, what are you doing here? Why, why would you be doing that thing that we're not used to you doing. Yeah. You know, and this like, is a funny which, thing. Now, it's intimidating as well. I know that in the in the, you know, in the handbook and stuff, it says that of course, a uh, relief society president can be invited to something like PEC at a at a bishop's discretion or whatever. And I've never been in a ward where a relief society president has not been in PEC. So that's why it, it, it's I know this happens, but I don't know if you yeah. uh Nylon or Al, have you guys seen it like repeatedly where where there are women who are like you said there are obviously ones who are invited. Well, that's just not a thing, and it's just so much of it is alien to me. I've maybe I've just been in enlightened wards or whatever. Well, have you, but, but Jeff, I mean, you bring up a really good point, which is that one of the purposes of this book is to perhaps help um, make some of these practices more consistent. Yeah. Because a lot of wonderful things are happening, um, and and in fact, we we built a site to go along with the book that's womenatchurch.com. And we're inviting people to submit their stories of, of things that are going right, like things that they. You have six discussions for women. We don't have. <laughs> we don't have six discussions. Uh, okay. No. Um, and but but uh, you know and so part of my purpose is with that is come share your story, tell us what's working in your ward, so that we can have that be sort of a crowdsourced library of best practices, and then we can make that more consistent because there are bishops out there. Somebody came up to me the other day and told me about a bishop who, was, who just until recently, until a woman prayed in conference, was still refusing to have a woman close sacrament meeting. <coughs> well, that bishop clearly so, needs to be flogged. Well, well the, can I? So can these, I, things, these things are happening, but, but as uh, you say, you know, in places that you've lived, happily, 
they're not as egregious. Um, and even places where you lived could be doing better, and I'm sure. And oh, I'm so sure. I'm sure. part of the yeah, book no is, is just challenging, you know, the, the leaders and the members in areas that, that in D.C. and other places you've lived to, to even take more of yeah, uh, step one. Uh, well, I'm forward. I'm personally but. campaigning for women to be Sunday school presidents. I know it in the book it <laughs> yes. says they have to be priesthood holders. I don't understand why, because no keys or like authority are really involved. But that's yeah. just. I, that's, what do you have to say about that, two- Nylon? <laughs> women. As I, it's a Sunday been it's been president. done in the past. Um, unfortunately, oh, okay. I've heard some stories of cool. of, pe- of bishops being um, asked to recall the calling. But really actually, I, yeah, yeah. But actually, I haven't heard a more. I haven't heard a recent story about that. There's stories that I've heard about that happened like 15, 20 years ago. Um, so I don't know what would happen if somebody tried it today. I'm sure somebody's gotten away with it somewhere. Um, what, you know, what part of it if, is that. Oh, go ahead. Well, part of it is you know, if a bishop wants to try something like that, part of that is about what kind of relationship does that bishop have with the state president, right? You know, and yeah. um, and and does the bishop have a relationship with the women of the ward that they would support him in that? You know, so because a lot of times you'll get one of the, a bishop who wants to do something like that, but then somebody tells on him to the stake president, you know, and then the stake president puts the kibosh on it. So I'll be honest, in most wards I've served in, no one would even notice because they don't know. Like, <laughs> why, why would I know that that's wrong? <laughs> <laughs> What about <laughs> female ward mission leaders? Anybody ever seen that? Um, I haven't actually seen that, but there's a great case study in the book about a fantastic program that's happening in one mission where the mission president, the stake president, and the stake relief society president all work together to make the stake relief society, and the, well, the, the relief society sisters um, specifically responsible for filling the 10 hours of humanitarian service that the missionaries have to do each week. Hmm. And this is in a major metropolitan city. And so the Relief Society sisters are creating these connections with these charitable organizations, and they're maintaining those relationships and being the long-term contacts for those relationships. But the missionaries are benefiting because they are then being sent off to do this 10 hours of work every week. And I interviewed the state president, and, and he just said that they're directly seeing baptisms from this program, and they're also seeing increased member missionary involvement because the Relief Society sisters are so engaged with the missionaries. I'm sorry. Are you suggesting that if we work together for the good of the gospel <laughs> that it would benefit us? I'm saying don't leave those women out of your meetings because they've got great insights. <laughs> are you saying nope. that if we actually combined our efforts – in some way in this church that it would be a good thing it would be it's outrageous amazing, it? I actually, this is I the problem with like women speaking section. in church these outrageous <laughs> ideas <laughs> calm down now calm down um you can i like see that I'm section passionate. too it made me think i've I, i'm currently i'm currently serve, uh, serving as an elders quorum president and i oh boy, here i've been we thinking go. about ways to go. get oh stop it all Basically, no, but I've been thinking about ways to get more involved in service. And it was good because, but I've been thinking more in an insular way, I think, lately. Um, not wanting to serve the church, but just thinking about my quorum and my brethren and trying to get out there and have service activities. And there is, and it really made me realize, hey, maybe there's more value in this. I should probably liaise with the Relief Society and actually try to maybe mm-hmm. powwow on stuff together. But I don't just want to do service activities that help the ward. I don't want to just paint somebody's fence and help somebody move. I think as Latter Day Saints, all enough too- feeding widows and no saving more widow babies. feeding. None of that. <laughs> but but as Latter Day Saints, all too often our service is so much within our own little family, our own tribe totally. instead. Yeah. And there's so much value, like you said, you know, in the, these missionary programs they're doing, and actually getting out and doing stuff with the community. I mean, I think, I think it's so funny that we. You know, we do our Mormon helping hands. We love our photo op, and we're happy to be involved in doing those great activities with the community once a year when it's that day of service. Right. Our alms before men were very good. Yeah, it's funny. But how great would it be if we were able to get in this mentality where it's like, no, you know what we're doing for a combined elders quorum relief society activity? We're going down to the soup kitchen, and we're helping out some night and do stuff be like that. Be awesome. And, and my, you know, if I can get on my soapbox for a minute about service in the Relief Society, I think service... I think making the Relief Societies responsible for those outreach efforts would help with some of the identity crisis that many women in the Relief Society are currently feeling the institution has. And that's one of the things that's worked so well in this particular stake is that the Relief Society feels like they have a particular role and a particular responsibility in the ward. And it's not administering the ward. It's not up there conducting services and holding the priesthood keys. It's managing and being the gateway to those service opportunities that gives us tremendous sense of purpose. And, um, I think 
I think we should all be. Uh, yeah, I would, I would love to see that all over. So the place. what you're saying is the name Relief Society is not just a clever name. <laughs> well, it's that. unfortunately it's it's relief among ourselves society as you're describing. Nothing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I, I would love to see it be World Relief Society instead. So, well, and I mean, it's it's that's actually interesting because you, we we can say that and we're all like, yeah, that that feels pretty good. That's, uh, you know, that's a little bit heresy in some circles right now to to say that, you know, to sort of suggest that that women should should sort of focus back on on their what they do or like what they've always done really well. And not try to uh, push forward the agenda on some of these other fronts, right? Like, it's it's just interesting interesting to me that that uh, I mean, when you say it, it makes it makes sense, and I'm all I'm all for it. Um, but there's there's a part of me too that's like, but wait, women women need more recognition and rights and uh, and forward movement that momentum. We don't want to lose that. Oh, I mean, I'm not, I don't think I'm suggesting we lose anything by doing that. I think, you know, I think what's, what's a wiser place to start than try to build on what you already have, right? And um, I, I, you know, I, I, I think that, that, I, I mean, I've always been, I, I've always been one who is, rather than seeking for, you know, men and women's responsibilities at church to be the same, have men and women's responsibilities at church to be uh, you know, of equal import, right? And that's why I love this idea of service because I think that um, it, it it builds on the original vision for the Relief Society, which was divine and which really had a global vision. Um, but I also think that it 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 protects a sort of sac sacred space for the feminine, divine, yeah. and the feminine um, uh, uh, ownership. That we we don't have now, and we wouldn't have if we were to uh, share male priesthood. Let me ask you this: That's fine. correlation, <laughs> big mistake or biggest mistake? Oh. Go. <laughs> Big or biggest? <laughs> that was a, listen. Uh, every that was every a cold good every you. good intention every good intention has some um, has some unintended consequences, right? There's the the great statement that you know there are the there there are the known unknowns and then there are the unknown unknowns and sometimes we you know yeah. I think look at New Mexico <laughs> absolutely there you know and one one example I use in the book is the idea of President Hinckley um, introducing the teachings of the prophets manuals you know and we're, uh -huh. right yeah we're, yeah. On, we're gonna be going on to President Benson next year and um, the intention for that from sweet President Hinckley who we would never accuse of having, you know, malintent, uh, was to get a doctrinal book in every member's home. Well, the, 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 that unintended, unforeseen consequence is that for 17 years we haven't had a female voice represented in priesthood and relief society, right? So, you know, correlation, correlation <laughs> made the global church possible. Yeah, no, it did, and, and there's no doubt about that. But. And, and, and at this point I feel like, you know, we're, we're kind of recognizing some of the long-term consequences of correlation, but you know, we can course correct. And I think that's what we're in the process of doing right now. And it's really interesting because this is stuff I wasn't so, even as aware. I read, uh, have you ever read the book, um, the one about uh, David O. McKay and the rise of modern Mormonism? Oh, Mo rise of modern Mormonism. Yeah. I've read so, uh, portions of it. Yes. Good, really good book, really interesting book. And it's fun to see the insights because correlation happened during that era. And, and not just mm -hmm. to see like any infighting, you know, between Hugh B. Brown and Harold B. Lee or anything like that. But to understand what the church was facing with rapid international growth, so that's why correlation was necessary. But you see how Relief Society used to be much more autonomous for a very long time, mm -hmm. for example. Relief Society did their own curricula. They did. They just kind of did their, their own, own thing. Their own magazine. Yeah. yeah. They own did budgets. their own thing. And then in an effort, but of course the perceived problem at the time wasn't just them. It was also other auxiliaries were also doing their own curricula. And so... Um, they said, whoa, 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 we don't want it to go off the rails. We don't want people to make up what they want without us knowing about it. Let's correlate. Let's create manuals that we can send down to everybody so it's all the same thing. But, yeah, like you said, I think one of the downsides of it has been, um, I guess, I guess. <laughs> I didn't even think of that. I didn't even think, like, it didn't even cross my mind that we've been listening strictly to, uh, ah! to like, a male version <laughs> of, of the gospel for the last 17 years. You're still processing I've, that, I've just aren't been you? I've and loving every minute. <laughs> Oh yeah, I've been relishing. 
I can't wait for Ezra Taft Benson. That's what I'm oh, thinking. Oh yes. Right. Yeah. The, the, the right. No, the, the, the greatest the, the greatest anti-communist. service you guys could do is start a start a petition for her, um for Eliza R. Snow to be the subject of next year's manual. I will uh, the greatest work. We're going to do <laughs> Occupy the Church Office Building Plaza. End <laughs> <Yeah>. quote. Occupy. <laughs> that would be great. Now that that I can I would totally get behind that. Who is so, with me? So with all with all the good examples and stuff that that you share that you share in the in the book. Do you have any examples of really bad women in there? <laughs> the bad girls of the Bible. Do you do you just monsters? The other... There's yeah. actually. You're just like no, and this one. Don't be like her. She's a jerk. <laughs> actually, I do. There's a yes. There's yeah? a Relief Society president in one anecdote who's very. Is it also Eliza R. Snow? Because she had a bad era. For what? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Her rebellious years. <laughs> I I never say anything bad about Eliza. There, there are a couple sort of wow. villain, villain bishops and stake presidents and relief society presidents and primary presidents, but they all. Wait. So, what's your bad example oh, that just, you share? Just uh, most of it is around limiting women who are are striving to sort of be uh, yeah. to to ex- expand that circle of influence that I was talking about earlier, and then women yes, limiting exactly. women, and then they get they get shot down, and and men limiting men. I mean, there there's. Um, there's an example that I use in the book of. Um, uh, if this podcast were a sitcom, that's what it would be called: men limiting men. <laughs> well, there, this this one really stake relief society president uh, wanted to include the sort of bullet point that there would be flushing toilets at girls' camp. Oh, and, this this uh, story is awesome, by the way. This is this one's really good. Okay, okay. Well, I'll I'll tell the story then. So, right. so there had been there uh, there had been some complaints from the previous year. This was a sort of inner city ward um, that the the girls were kind of uncomfortable uh, with the toilet situation at girls camp because girls have different needs than boys, and um, and so the state relief really, state and women's president was was trying to be sensitive to that and um, and wanted to specify the facilities at the young women's camp. And the state president thought it was inappropriate to put a reference to bodily uh, functions on a girls' camp flyer. And so he vetoed the reference to flushing toilets. You know, it's a small thing, but the, no. but the state relief society president who was communicating the story said, you know, I felt it was my stewardship to understand the girls and understand what was going to keep them from going to girls' camp and understand their fears and their, you know, nervousness. And for many of these girls, because it was an inner city ward, this was the only camping experience they would have ever had. Um, and so she just felt like, you know, her stewardship and her uh, her responsibility for be the, being a spokeswoman for those girls was sort of undercut. Yeah, that's fair. Well, that's... <laughs> I, I actually agree with the stake president. Buck up, you women. <laughs> Don't look for flushing toilets. Get out there and poop in the woods like the rest of us. One, uh, one, one common thread I saw, though, at least in many instances, it, and I guess it's... I understand it, why it would be this way. A lot of Relief Society presidents will get frustrated with bishops, and they kind of view each other at parity or really at odds with one another. But it's interesting to me because when I think about a ward organization, I get it. It's Obviously, there's nothing you can do if a bishop is... He's in charge of the ward, and that's a man, and that's a man with a priesthood. But wouldn't the analog to a Relief Society president actually be the elders quorum president, the high priest group leader? Shouldn't those kind of you, – you see many of these anecdotes with women who are frustrated where it's like they feel like it's the Relief Society versus the bishopric. When if you're really trying to put two things side by side, you would have the Relief Society has responsibility for – their women. The elders quorum has its responsibility for its men. The bishop, of course, is overarching on all those things. And I thought it, I, I just thought it was very interesting that so many people were frustrated by that. That's Well, it's interesting you... you say that because, um, because when you go back and you look at the language uh, of the original minutes, Joseph Smith set up the Relief Society presidency uh, to have stewardship over the women just as and those are his words, the first presidency has its own stewardship. And hmm. so um, so, so a lot of the, the Relief Societies... But he was joking. He was joking. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, he wasn't being serious. Um, well... <laughs> Al, you are no denigrating no, everything <laughs> Island stands for. <laughs> um, so I'll, tell you, I'll give you another example, though. Up until about the 1920s, 
the um, General Relief Society president had her office right across from the prophet's office in the church administration building. Hmm. And when Emmeline Wells was General Relief Society president, um, I think I think in the first 20 years of the 20th century, I don't know exactly what year it was, um, the bishop's building was built. And the bishop's building no longer exists. But at that time, when the bishop's building was built, um, the, her office was moved out of the church administration building to the building that housed the presiding bishopric. And this was devastating to her because she understood exactly you know, what this symbolized, um, that she was being taken off of that, that parody with the prophet and being then paired with the presiding bishopric. Um, so, you know, I don't know that, I, 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 historically, the parody has been there. I guess that's my point. Um, and I also think that even if you do look at, uh, it, you know, the, elder, the men are divided into elders, quorum, and high priests. Um, and so I don't know that there's exact parody there. The, the bishop is, you know, the ironic priest, Pre, uh, responsible for the erotic priesthood in, in right. the ward. And so I think that, I, 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 I don't think that the equation really is um, Relief Society to, to elders form because of those historical elements and also because of the additional structural elements. I have to say, I am going to remember here, that. We the next time the Relief Jeff. Society president comes to you. me for something, I'm going to just pass it upstairs and say, sorry, <laughs> this isn't my concern. <laughs> I'm coming to you now. Um, you guys want well, you guys want to do some news? Oh, we could do some Mormon stuff. That that was that was actually great. That was a very very interesting little chatter. And I I uh, yeah, I'm glad we got you to. Gonna, you gonna read the book? Nothing with makes Al, me I'll happier. I'll sign your copy at Saturday's Waffles next week. Oh, How about sweet. that? Oh my gosh, <laughs> let's do a Saturday's Waffle <laughs> book signing. Great. Yes, Mike and Rich will be fine with it. I'm sure. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'll totally read it. I'll give, I'll give it a read. I'll dabble in these women's issues. What is it? Women, women in the church? church. Women at hyphen, church. Women at church hyphen. What's the rest <laughs> of it? Don't worry about the rest of it. I know it, it keeps does. going. Don't you try don't and fool me now. I'll plug it. Women at church. Women at church, church magnifying women, LDS women, women at local the church event. building. Women <laughs> at the church building. <laughs> We know what's I'm in the freezer. I'm pretty sure if I Google we'll, women uh, at the church building. Yeah, this doesn't give me a lot of good results. <laughs> okay. I'm getting a lot of Methodist <laughs> things. Uh, I see a picture of Kate Kelly, though. So that she did, she did a good job there. She made it uh, to the church building. For us. Do, you, do you talk about the ordained women movement at all in your book? Like, is that no, something that comes I do, up? No, I do a brief history of the gender conversation at church, stretching back all the way to the founding of the Relief Society and... Um, you know, the point is the the gender relations. I think I say is are in the are in the soil that the church grew from. I mean, when we look at the impact of polygamy, first of all, uh, you know that I don't think we can I don't think we can overstate how how important gender has been in the entire structure of the church, both culturally and doctrinally. Um, we have you know a revolutionary uh, gender doctrine. We are one. Of, how does that relate to polygamy? Hold on. What? How, why is polygamy? How, is is that bad? That was bad for women. Well, yes? no? no, I'm just saying no that, that it, it, it caused the relationship between men and women to be the topic of conversation for a very long time, mm. to be a key topic of conversation for a oh, very I long see. time, right? Because polygamy is about how do men and women relate to each other? Are they romantically linked? Are they eternally linked? Are they practically linked? You know, are they linked in their in in labor? What what is the purpose of their of their working together? How how do they work yes. together? Right? Does a man have to have a number of women in order to accomplish his purposes and to get his work done, um, or is that can that work be done one on one? That is a terrible question for any man to ask. <laughs> how, how many women do I need to do this? Task? Well, uh, in the ward council, the in the ward council, the issue is ten to three. Women, so take say that take that as you will, but. Did you find, um, not, not to dwell much oh, on the ordained women stuff, but I imagine, you know, a book takes some time to put together. Was Were a lot of those mentions kind of last minute rewrites you had to do to sort of get it in there before publication? Cause, well, cause, that's I mean, actually just, a great question. Because you just published it. I mean, the book's only, what, three weeks old or so? And then three, or a yeah, month so, or so? so I Yeah, submitted, so I submitted the manuscript to the publisher two weeks before Kate Kelly got her disciplinary notice. Oh, wow, okay. So, so the book was written in kind of, a very silent, a very peaceful, right. quiet period, mostly in uh, January, February, and March. 
And then, of course, they did the second walk on Temple Square in April, so there's events. And so when um, when Kate Kelly was excommunicated, I went back and I, and I did revise uh, just some brief historical mm-hmm. mentions. Okay. But that was it. That was it. And um, I, I really like that about the book in that it was written – it wasn't written as a response – to the disciplinary council, it was written in this sort of very separate, separate time that was. Yeah. Uh, sort of and I don't think from. it it plays off that way. It, it's actually strikes me. It's it's in some interviews I've seen with you. Like some people view you like you're some kind of a heretic, which is really hilarious to me because I feel like even in this discussion, this all seems like a pretty sensible back and forth we're all having here. I mean, like I understand why someone why someone yes. like Kate Kelly could. Uh, that no, like, I hate you now. <laughs> but you understand why ordained women can be right. divisive for people. And it's very obvious why I think they're – we've talked about it a lot on the show. But, like, their tactics, kind of the methods they employed might not have been the best way to be well-received by the broader yeah. populace. And so it's just it, – it amazes me that there are, there's a huge chunk of people in our church who might see a discussion even like this as, like, you people are crazy. What on earth are you talking about? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, in in one evening, people will come up to me and tell me, you know, you're so brave, you're so courageous, which I appreciate. But on the other hand, the next person will come up to me and say exactly what you just said, which is like, what, like, <laughs> this What's isn't this isn't that, yeah, this is pretty pra- practical stuff. Have and, you gotten any any real flack from it? Like, have people have you had eggs thrown at your house or like meat soiled and thrown in your I, in your exhaust I, pipe? Listen, the the. The joy of walking the middle line is that if you're not making somebody upset, you're not doing your job, right? That's you're not true. middle enough. Um, yeah, I've got people on both sides who are who are mad at me. You know, on on the more progressive side, people think that um, it's too naive. It's uh, milk. You don't toast. have enough it's, teeth. You know, yeah. losing hard-earned ground, right? And um, on the other side, which is just as vocal and you know, very very large and significant, um, I'm I'm challenging. Um, the way things are supposed to be. So, well, well, very so good. the lesson very here good. is to have fewer people hate us. We should be a radical on one end of the spectrum or the other. <laughs> that yeah, well, because then it, you yeah, only have exactly. a few left. That's it's all only come from key. one side that way. It's not you know you're not you're not fighting two fronts. Right, so so uh, we do we do have a little bit of Mormon news here in the in the time that we have left. Let's Jeff. Uh, we oh, there's so right much. One, there's... Leading leading out, I feel like the big yes. news this week is the Deseret Alphabet Translator. But I love the Deseret that, Alphabet Translator. Ordain Women has uh, updated their, their website. They have some next steps, uh, some some next steps for us. And, and this, I mean, really, the the story about this, I, I mean, again, I'm not, I'm not quick to, like, just, just say, let's forget about this. Uh, it's, it's opened up some interesting dialogue. Honestly, the conversation that we just had is interesting, a lot of it because of the conversations that have, uh, that have been ongoing with some of the ordained women stuff. And so we'll continue to sort of keep you guys updated on this rather than, uh, than let it lie and never talk of it again. Uh, but, but the update is, uh, they, they said they're not marching on, on Temple Square again. They, they suggest you go to your local priesthood meetings and enjoy priesthood there, uh, which, which is great. It's good. That's, that's what, what they probably the, could the have done in the agrees. first place before all this stuff happened. Yeah, well, I mean, so it's it's sort of the equal ground that uh, that they were trying to reach previously. So there you go. That's that's the update. That's the big news. That's this. W- In this other week's top news, story. there's a BYU fan on Twitter who has been making fun of Virginia, <laughs> Virginia football players, in hilarious fashion. Jeff, you look. You've seen this. Nylon, have you seen this? I have seen. I've this, seen this, but I yes. don't care about BYU sports. I think- so you can. I think it's a little bit brilliant, mainly for the guy that that uh, he just <laughs> takes pictures from like the the uh, the the roster page where they're all in a suit and tie, and then he yeah. put like an animal's head on them or something. Well, it's bad tax. Uh, but my favorite too, one right? is the one where he. I thought they <laughs> the accepted where... it very graciously. I mean, I they, they totally did. Yeah, they were they were pretty. Kick, they got a kick out of it. But my favorite one is is either uh, the cowardly line or else the uh, the voted most likely Andrew King most likely to have arrived on campus by sailboat. I feel both of those are very spot on. I, I was entertained. So Boney Fuller, well done. I'm following you now. You've done something right. So in other news, uh, I'm gonna re- I'm just gonna read the headline from Herald Media. LDS Church wants to meet your grandma. That's what it says. The church wants to okay. meet the grandma. 
What does this mean? Is the church partnering with Tinder for a new senior citizen singles <laughs> effort? Yet another committee? This is the mid singles of Utah. This is my <laughs> life. This is what I've done. <laughs> As a side note, um, Al, I've I told you the time that I went to a, a New Year's dance that was for all singles, but it was actually just like mid singles. And then my band of YSA back in the. Uh, and then it's just 50 year old, 50 year old women looking to get some. It was uh, actually, it was hilarious. I had wonderful dances with, you know, baby boomers and stuff. And it was a, just a, a delightful time. <laughs> These are the worst Valentine's this Day New nights Eve, of but, a man's but, life and a woman's. I'm sure. Though the one lesson oh, I learned terrible. from this was if I were ever a bishop, it's if I were ever a, a bishop shot. and I were to be counseling couple, you know, couples struggling with their marriage, which happens, I would say, go to one of these dances. You will <laughs> see what is out there for you. And that's it. Are, are, you, are you flaunting your wedding ring, Nyland? Is that what that was? Oh, 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 no, sorry. I... Oh, I don't have to go to those dumb dances. Well, big whoop. Because I'm still there Friday night right. after anyway, Friday night. Anyway, the point night. is um, the, uh, the church is trying – they've been doing a lot of these genealogy pushes this year with Family Search, whether it's indexing, you know, blitzes and stuff like that. So they're doing a 10-day blitz from September 20th to the 29th to try to collect 10,000 stories about grandmas from around the world. So that's what's going down. So if you're uh, idea. if you're into that or if you have good stories about your grandma. I challenge you to only submit your most disgusting stories of your grandma. We all have them. That time grandma couldn't make it to the bathroom or that other Ugh. time where she mistook salt for sugar and ruined the pancakes. Only Listen, share those I think it's stories. awesome. As a marketer, they're totally trying to get into, you know, your the the their their audiences personal um drive to to share you know i mean we're it's such a narcissistic love sharing. self-sharing community we and love my, sharing so i think my grandma loves that. sharing it's true what will they do with 10, my grandmother stories? was raised in the mormon colonies and if you sit down and dare mention colonia juarez you will be there for the next three hours or while she tells you these tales <laughs> so I need to I need to get my grandma in on this because she will just she will regale them with all sorts of things. It'll be wonderful. <laughs> that's that's what this really should be. It should just be a bunch of old grandmas talking. And, and this, they could just be like they'll have like the the conversation starts be like tell me about when you were a kid, and then every story will start. Well, they couldn't wear pants to school when I was a kid. I that's can't even the big thing. And off they go, and we'll have. 10, yeah, I can't even tell you how many stories about Pancho Villa I've heard in my life. So many stories. <laughs> I love my grandma. He my grandma like is the maker. reason why on job applications and other things, I select that I am part Hispanic because I am a quarter Mexican. <laughs> Not From racially. Your grandma? Because she's German. But politically, I am a quarter Mexican. <laughs> such a dork. And I don't, f I don't feel bad about it. All right, that. whatever. There's another article in the, uh, in the Salt Lake Tribune, and it got picked up by Huffington oh. Post. Uh it is Mormons Mormon rap. like Republicans. What? <laughs> Jeff, hold on. Pick your job off the floor. This is a real thing. Did you know? I, I, was, I was not aware of this. <laughs> Did you know that Mormons are favoring largely Republican But why, values? Al? But is the question thing? is, why? Well, Jeff, I'll tell you. It's because. Now, this is dumb. This is a dumb story, uh, but, but it's true. One of the, the only interesting tidbit I got out of here was that they said, they said Romney garnered less of the Mormon vote than George W. Bush. That's, that was fascinating yeah. to me. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people that were like, no, I'm not voting for Romney just because he's a Mormon. No, absolutely not. I wouldn't do that. But Bush, it was like, here's a man that represents our values our thoughts but do you think that's why beliefs. do you think it was do you guys think it was a lot of mormons who were just thinking i don't want to be part of the stereotype by voting for romney ergo i will not vote for Romney. Oh, i totally do uh, the conversations that i that well, i had around the uh, election time was totally that. or is it people voting for gary johnson yeah but it could have been gary johnson voters yes nyland yes nyland yeah. i well i just i thought it would be i thought it would be helpful to see how the 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 Mormon statistic has changed from the time of voting for Bush to to Romney, right? So they said that like seventy six percent of active, very active Mormons are currently Republican, and I just wonder if that's 
is that lower than when Bush mm. was running? You know, maybe it's just a reflection of our own changing demographic and in, in our our own membership. Because I mean, the Salt Lake Democrats screw everything up. Yeah. Don't they? yeah. I, <laughs> I actually was surprised. I was just was surprised that the number. I mean, I was surprised the number was so high. Maybe that's because I'm hanging out with too many Salt Lake Democrats. But I thought it. I don't know. I thought it was going to be more like sixty forty. Yeah. So I was actually surprised that it was almost eighty percent of active Mormons. I was actually shocked though when Mitt Romney well, won. Ran. I mean, he won Utah handily, but I was fully expecting some sort of absurd lopsided. Lop, I mean, I was thinking like DC voting for a Democrat when it goes like 92 8. I was expecting that kind of a relationship for Utah with Mitt Romney. And so when he took it handily, but not in just a full blown cleanup fashion, I, alo- I was also disappointed. I said, Mitt, these are your people. You have ignored us. And now you are not president. And now Obama is still president. I think we lost Al. Oh, that's we okay. We can chug along without him. This will be just like last week when he chugged along. I don't know what he's doing. Oh, <laughs> I think he wants in again. Oh, he's doing a different chat. Oh, this Alan. Take me there. Oh, boy, what's that? I don't know where Al is. Maybe he'll figure it out. Do you need me to do anything? No, to you do just anything? hang out. You're doing a great job. You're You're okay. doing great things. <laughs> So uh, we we alluded to it. This is a quick one right here. Maybe, actually, I can hold on. Let me add him real quick. This is how we'll get him on here. Al Al Don Doctor Bill. Whatever. He's not showing up. I don't know what his problem is. Hopefully, we'll figure it out. So um, the uh, President Benson manuals are for next year. Isn't that exciting? How do you feel about President Benson manuals? I I mean I think it'll be really interesting to actually do a manual that. I mean, I'd, I'd be interested in statistics, but I remember, right? It's the first one that somebody of my generation actually remembers. Um, and, you know, he wasn't he wasn't prophet for a long time, but he certainly was a powerful presence through most of my childhood. So, I don't know. I think it's going to be a little bit uh, – I think it will be very interesting. Of course, you know, I would also be extremely interested in the Violet Kimball manual or the, the – uh, you know, I don't know. The Lizar Snow Manual we were talking about earlier. But that's for yes. another year, I guess. Or the Zina, okay. Zina B. Young. Who's manual. Zina? What are you talking about, Zina B. Young? Was she prophet? Zina, Zina Young. These sound like made up names. <laughs> or. Um, Didn't she write. The Emily oh, Wells. Israel, Israel, God is calling. What would Zina B. Young's manual include? What, what did she do? This is this is the tragedy of of modern Mormon men. Is, is I have tragedy. no idea who this person is, Zina. Zina You're reading D. a Wikipedia Young. article. This they isn't you don't Jacob know Smith that. Young. Come I am. On. I had to look it up because I knew B wasn't the right middle initial. <laughs> um so she was the third she was the third um yeah. General Relief Society right. president. So, so so will we oh, and, go ahead. and and no, she was uh, one of um, Brigham Young's wives, and just an incredibly, um, just one of the people that 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 women, female historians of the church, just really rally around. Amazing stories will, from her life, um, and there's some great. Auto, will great will men there. rally around her? And I don't mean to break it down that the genders are different, you know but like it says in your book, you know, we as men also need to be comfortable learning from strong female leaders and stuff so yes yes did she pull an ox out of a mire or anything no. of that nature? no mary fielding not was. interested move along so back to the communist hater ezra taft benson <laughs> well i have a friend who recently did a poll and asked um gospel doctrine classes to name five men from church history and five Ooh. women from church history and I don't remember the exact percentages, but they were. That's pretty, actually a good game. Dad, dire. I, I feel I feel like you could just make up names like Zina and Shaniqua and stuff, and you'd get you get <laughs> Janiqua oh Axbury. Oh but I goodness. I appreciate the under the underlying <laughs> tragedy that oh, this is. That's Al. You are totally on the hook for reading my book. I expect All you right, to be I'm quoting gonna... from Zina D. H. Young in your next last doc gospel doctrine lesson that's a fair talk. point because i would be like marjorie p hinckley 
I'm going to give her three more middle initials, but I will. <laughs> I've named one woman so far. Fair enough. I've got Zina D-H-S-P-C-A Young. <laughs> Who else do we have? we got Emma Smith. We have President Monson's daughter. President, right, we... Mon- President Monson's daughter. Yeah, and, and Div. Div. I was blinking on her name. I'm not sure she's. I'm not sure she's from history. If she's still hold on, alive. her name is <laughs> Ann Dib. Ann Dib. Dib. Oh. No, they have to be I was dead. Say, no wonder they she's have not to remembered be dead. with a name like that. They have to be dead. Have so that's dead. the rule. They have to be dead. Can you name? Can you? Can you name five? Marjorie dead? Hinckley. You said Emma President Smith. President Monson's Monson's wife. <laughs> you know, that doesn't count. What was her first name? She. The only requirement. <laughs> what was her was first that name? Not be alive. No. I'm. I her first name was a name. Oh, I heard the typing. The typing was something of your Come own on. doing. Come on, Jeff. Oh. We've got an Eliza R. Snow. Okay. We've got a Zina SPCA. <laughs> we've got we've got Emmeline Wells. Does Emmeline Rose. Wells ring any bells? Yes. Okay. Mary Fielding. Who, who was Emmeline, Emmeline Wells? Who Jeff? was Emmeline Wells? Emmeline Wells was actually No no no, not you, not you. This oh. is for Jeff. He said yes, he oh. knows. Emmeline yeah, Wells, I believe again. she was some form of a Disney Imagineer at some point. Oh, my point. goodness. You're, <laughs> you're thinking of Elsa from Frozen, and it's a different person. Well, Anybody Elsa from, know of the, wi- right, the woman's, the this woman's is a problem. exponent? Yeah, I'm familiar mean, with the woman's. That... Yes, yes, yes. Uh, okay, she wrote that. okay. He's not. He's just saying that to make no, you I'm feel fa- better. No, I'm familiar with it. Jeff has no idea. So, so Emmeline, Emmeline was the fifth general president of the Relief Society. And she was also the editor of the Woman's Exponent, I think, for like 30 years. She was hardcore. Or something. I would have to look that up. She was also a suffragist. She was really, uh, uh, you know, active in the suffrage. Yeah, she was the editor for almost uh, 40 years. Were. They, um, they stopped producing the right. Exponent. In, Hold on. We got, we got a few others to bust through here, Jeff. We got it. World War I started and they stopped making the Woman's Exponent. Hang. So uh, some other stuff, some other stuff to mention here. Bishop H. David Burton has been appointed or uh, elected to be appointed the uh, the chairman of the UTA board. So finally, I'll have a buddy in the business next time I ride the transport without a ticket and I get caught. I'll be like, hey. Does that happen to you a lot, Al? Do you hop on tracks and just go for the honor system? No, it was one time. I, the train was there and I was late, so I hop on. The one time I do it. I was sitting in traffic school. How to not get run over by a train? I was okay. like, "This is the worst," and I had to pay forty bucks. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> so I've it also, really I've also, I've heard through terrible. the rumor mill, just from some contacts, that the uh, Provo Temple is allegedly going to get slated for a a do over, much akin to the Ogden Temple, and of course, yeah, which is sad. Which is sad that the the crazy circle seventies look is uh, obviously be, this be would gone. this would make it's sense kind of once a... the city center temple is done. They say, Great Provo, we built you a second temple. Now we're gonna close the other one that's been open. And so this is what I'm hearing, and they're gonna potentially double its square footage. I don't know if that's through an annex or something along those lines, but uh, Well it's actually good because if you tried to go to the Provo Temple at any it's time a madhouse. you've waited three sessions to get in. Yeah, it's and like you Jordan never, River. Jordan River and Provo feel like the factories. You never feel like a bigger <laughs> schmuck than when you're cutting in line at the temple and you're like, oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry, were you waiting too? I'll get you on the next one. I do, I mean, as, as crazy as the birthday cake is, at least it's distinctive though. I feel, I, I, you know, I'm I sorry, love, the, I love that's the a, birthday I've heard that one before, yeah. Is that I a, don't know. I've always called it the birthday cake. cake. The house of the Lord? <laughs> <laughs> I would be sad differing levels of respect is what hey, this is. Hey, no, no throwing I mean, stones from you. The Provo <laughs> Temple, it looks like a relic from the 70s, which it is. But at the same time, since since Ogden is gone now, I would say let's preserve that yeah. memory. And it looks different. The Ogden Temple is right there in downtown. It doesn't have scenic stuff behind it. Provo, you got you got the whole rock canyon and the things and the mountains behind it. No, Let it be. Because if they make it bigger, it's going to, you know, it'll be bigger. I don't, it doesn't need to be bigger. It works just fine. And they're going to get a pace, uh, temple in Payson soon anyway. They don't. Oh, they the don't Payson one is built, I believe. It's quite lovely. You can oh, see it okay. Away. Yeah, it's it's almost done. It's not oh. dedicated yet, but it's, uh, it's, it's coming right along. Uh, uh, there's another one. There's a missionary who was serving his mission in Alaska. <laughs> this was like four so years good. ago this happened. And I don't know how we missed this, but he was he was at a nonprofit like, petting zoo and was leaning over... F- 
scooping up some feed and he was <laughs> he was headbutted by a muskox. And so he was suing the nonprofit organization for two hundred thousand uh, dollars for somehow being negligent by having him lean over a fence to scoop seed and getting headbutted from a from a Missourian. I say he got his comeuppance. Apparently, he didn't agree. He sued for two hundred thousand dollars, got ten grand in a settlement that was finally awarded four years later. Uh, you know. Michael Simpkins, you just got to let this go, man. You got headbutted four years ago. You got to move on with your life. You got to get out of... You don't want to be known as the muskox headbutt bandit. That's not going to help anyone. I mean, I wonder what happened. Is there any mention so, of what... I mean, obviously, he was, let's see. There was a doctor's diagnosis of, and I quote, muskox headbutt trauma. <laughs> That's a real thing with doctors and medicine That's and everything, hardcore. Jeff. Oh, boy. That's... Uh, yeah, sometimes you just have to let things go. I mean, of course, I'd want someone to cover my medical expenses if I was also rammed by a. Uh, but no, if you're headbutted for leaning over a fence, well, it's you're your own in there. Fault. You assume all, you assume all both. Also, are- with a muskox, with a muskox on the other side of the fence, don't lean over the fence. There's a big muskox. When I lived in there. Scotland, I would hop over the fence with Scottish cattle, and we would walk around together and talk about things, and it was very normal. And I was not afraid, and I I, I commingled with them without reservation. What? How many of these were musk oxen with huge? Have horns? Have you not seen Scottish cattle? No, they're like little dogs. No, no, no. They're, it's like a no, sheep ter- with a short... No, they're, they're like the size of a tank. They're panzers with horns. That's not true. That's not true. It is true. Scottish cattle, Jeff, you you golf through them. They're weak things. <laughs> anyway, it's neither here nor there. That's, well, that was... Tell us about about MLS going away. Oh, well, this is, this is one for... Uh, if anyone in the church has ever had the fine privilege of using the software MLS, Membership and Leadership Software, I don't know what the acronym actually That's stands for. That's not the real definition. I, I might be wrong. Um, it's what the church uses for everything involving clerking, records, tithing, reporting. All that stuff is done through MLS. And MLS is typically restricted to a computer in a clerk's office in your building, which in the modern day and age with us being mobile people who want access to everything via the internet has made it a bit disadvantageous to uh, to try to use and, you know, because who wants to have to make a trip to the church to do everything? Not all of us live in Utah where the church building wants, is in maximum of three blocks away. Who wants to away. go to the church? Well, I'm just saying, I have to drive for 10 minutes to go to my building. It's, it's asking too much for me. So... Um, anyway, so th- how dare the Lord? How dare he? So we we received a tip off recently from an anonymous account. Someone keeps forwarding us internal emails. You know what, from- don't, Jeff? Don't oust our our source. I'm not going to out the source. We have a deep throat. It's really exciting. So basically, you can't tell people that it's not really that big a deal because this isn't. Anyway, the point is, a thing went out just saying that. Uh, there's a thing called LCR, which is Leadership and Clerk Resources, which is an online version that's tied to your LDS login. It's been available to bishops, stake presidents, mission presidents, and the like for a little while. Now they're filtering it down. And it's not just for uh, Relief Society presidents or Elders Quorum presidents, what have you. My- it can be for young women's presidencies, activities, committees, all, all those sorts of things. So it's, it's sort of trickling down right now. And if you go to LDS.org slash LCR... Try it with your login and see what shows up. Right now, I can get in and see people's records, but I can't do any home teaching reporting, <laughs> so it's still not helping me. My, Niall, that's a good question. I recall that section in your book when you discussed your name. Well, I don't know. Wait, do you hate the Smiths? Did did you not take your husband's name? <laughs> you savage. The airport. And you know what's really funny? About, and it's funny when I was reading that, that little bit in your book about that in the church software. I was thinking, and my first thought was like, yeah, did they, because you actually talked about how your husband, that's all from this tradition from his mission in Spain and all that stuff. I served a mission in Spain too, so I felt this kinship. Oh, gosh. This wonderful, Here we go. This wonderful oh, kinship. Boy. And, um, right. but it's true. Which uh, which mission was he in, by the way? Oh please, that's a tough one. That 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 one's rough. I would give him that definitely. I was in Barcelona, where God's country basically. So, um, but that's a good point. I don't know. I know because 
abroad, they can do that because of naming conventions in Spanish-speaking nations as well as other places. But in the States, yeah, they don't do it. I also like how they default right now on records in the cell phone era. If I don't have a landline in my house, the family phone number is just my cell number, which is, I mean, it's fine. But I'm like, if you want to talk to my wife, just call my wife's cell. It's right there. This isn't like I'm, I'm sitting around with the home line just answering the phone, people. It, I, don't, I don't understand. Al, you look displeased with this conversation. No, it's just more Spain and jibber jabber, Jeff. That's all. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not displeased at all. I don't, are you are you done with your? Yeah. Uh, so check it out. The, ideally, LCR is supposed to completely replace MLS, so all things can be done remotely via a login. That which, that which would be great. Could you imagine reporting your home teaching via mobile app? Yeah. Please. Let this happen. I mean, how blessed and how blessed would that be overall? For- push notifications up the yin yang. Hey, did you read your scriptures today? That's your ward mission leader. I can't wait. Anyway, keep an eye out for it. Go try it right now. See if you have any access to it. I got a thing earlier in August that said it would be available by the end of August. So I decided to check it out on Sunday to see if it was going. And lo and behold, I got in. And that was a, a, a very dangerous distraction during third hour on Sunday. <laughs> All I wanted to do was just scroll through stuff and just look around. And I was... Uh, all right, very quickly, there's uh, there's another article on religion news, uh, the religion news service, which is a service with screaming women in the in the banner, <laughs> kind of a disconcerting. Um, it's a totally they, fine uh, blog. You, oh my gosh, oh, it's a weird header. You got to give me that. It's a weird header. The but the article is on is on uh, the church using social media to sort of push back or members of the church using social media to sort of push back against the church uh, on different issues. There's been a big push on flooding the earth via social media and all of that sort of rhetoric. Um, yeah. The idea being that that everybody, you know, every Mormon that's using the, uh, the, the, the interwebs will have great things to say, push forward. But there's been a, there's been a lot of, uh, of demonstrating and sort of rallying and highlighting issues Using that same social media platform that that you know, believe it or not, is has brought about a lot of attention from uh, from the bre- the brethren, which is I I mean I don't like I like that I like that it's getting to the to where people are actually seeing it, and uh, when issues come up, it's great. the The only downside to that is we're sort of airing our dirty laundry in front of everyone, which which isn't always the most comfortable thing because the I don't want to. I don't want to be having ordained women conversations with my non-member buddies. I want to be talking about the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith and those kind of things with them, uh, rather than, you know, the the trending hashtag on Twitter right now. I don't know. It's a fair point, and it puts us in an interesting place as a sort of news outlet on Mormon ish- on Mormon stuff as well, because obviously we play into you know the the good and the nice and the less fortunate in the news at the same time, but. What can you do? The the crippled children in the news also get a mention. The, yeah, there's a, there's two more points here. One is that is that uh, I mean, sort of the oversharing of Mormondom uh, as we as we just incestually share between each other, uh, the the good and the bad. A lot of the message of what we're trying to do, I think, is is diluted, right? The well, the apostles are on Twitter. The ap- I was not pleased with Elder Bednar's "Let's flood the earth" push. You guys go and do it. I'm g- I'm gonna stay here. Well, I think watch. it was more that like we're happy to flood the earth, but like 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 Nyland just said, we we also would love to have content from our you know our brother. I think they're getting a little bit better. Twitter, I think, is difficult because it's Twitter, but on Facebook, I've noticed a few more things. Like Elder An- Elder uh, Anderson uploaded a photo album of his recent trip to Peru. I'm probably wrong on the location, but. Uh, on traveling around. And that's the sort of stuff we'll still get in church news that's always been that way. But we're seeing them embrace these opportunities to share little albums in that way. And that's good. That's good. Thomas S. Monson, if you're listening, add me on Snapchat and wake up with me every morning, will you? Can we do that? I'm still Please. pushing for the Dieter F. Uchtdorf selfie during conference. When that happens, <laughs> Dude, it, will, he... it will be the most shared piece of social media in church history. If he ran and laid across the other brethren's laps and then took a selfie, that would be great. Um, all right, so a, a couple quick ones to yeah, finish we up. up. We have there's a Mormons versus Zombies Kickstarter. <laughs> I think it's I think it's a little bit ridiculous. Uh, Nyland loves it. <laughs> she, you thought it was brilliant. 
I mean, there's a Boy I, Scout. There's a woman with Jello. It. There's a mom with bread and four. I hate it because it's ten thousand dollars. They're trying to raise ninety thousand dollars for this thing. I doubt it's going to hit it, which means that that now it's just another failed Kickstarter project. But ten thousand dollars to get my own character. If he knows what's good for him, he will make a character out of me, and my weapon will be the pen, and my shield will be the sword, and I will conquer the earth. What? Uh, let's see other things that are <laughs> happening. The Mormons Meet the Mormons uh, movie is playing in two theaters near nowhere near you. Um, it's it's you just they want you to lobby to bring it to where you are. Now here's the thing: no one's gonna pay nine dollars to go see a movie. Uh, it's just a long version of the "I Am a Mormon" campaign. Why is this a good idea? Why are we doing this? Well, we're doing and, it because... And if we all campaigned and brought it... If we all campaigned and brought this Mormon movie to our local theater, and then they have disastrous attendance because no one's going to pay $9 to see what they can see on YouTube for free, what have we done? Yeah, I'm I'm curious about it on that. I understand the purpose of it. It's noble. It's good. And it's obvious that it's easy to get it to play in Utah's market. But Utah's market is arguably the place where it's least needed, given the purposes of the film. But I do think you're going to be... Jeff, they need family home evening activities. I mean, but it, but it depends. It's hard because it's basically just a documentary, like you said, that's I'm a Mormon. If it were a Mormon film, you know, if it's, say, the Saratov approach, which did play elsewhere, which is not a perfect film by any means. If it were like a fictional Motab film. Or the fictional Motab film, which might like get carried... Something with a, with a plot, a storyline you could really sink your teeth into. I'll switch over to that. A man named Mr. Kruger. I'll switch over to that one. Living... They are auditioning. <laughs> Candlelight Media Group is announcing that auditions for Singing with Angels will begin with video auditions, which can be submitted from September 8th onward. So this is going to be a fictional Call an story. Call open Here's looking at you. The fictional story of one woman's journey to join the choir. I see this being... In a couple of years, no, 18 months tops, this will be played between sessions of conference. Absolutely. This, it'll be like on the errand of angels or whatever. It's going to be great. Wait. It okay. I'll All right. Our last thing real quick. I'll reference it before. The Deseret Alphabet Translator. It's very simple. Someone took the old Brigham Young created Deseret Alphabet. And you can just type in your English text. Hit the little translate button. And it will be written in Deseretian for you. Now, I tried to paste this into Facebook, but I just got a bunch of Unicode. It did not work. Facebook does not recognize these special characters, unfortunately. And it made me very sad. But, um, <laughs> folks, use it. It's, it's enlightening. You can. I just love the whole the fact that Brigham Young created a different alphabet. Talk about a way to try to stick it to the U.S. He's like, forget it. We're in Mexico now, everyone. We are making our own alphabet. Oh, wait. Now we're not part of Mexico anymore. Then it was just you. Because America stole it. So, Anyways, it's pretty fun. We'll happens. link to it on the, on the oh. site, but it's kind of fun to mess with. Just, you know, it's sort like a party thing. trick. Uh, folks, I think that's going to, it's time to wrap it up. It's been a long one. Oh, it has been delightful. Yeah. Just really nice. You're, you're at Nyland McBain. On All everything. Right. Okay. We will follow you there. You can follow us. We are at The Real Twim. Or uh, This Week in Mormons on Facebook. Come leave a comment. Also, This Week in Mormons Say on Instagram. Hello. And, of course, visit us at thisweekinmormons.com. And if you haven't subscribed to our podcast, we hope you'll do that. And we hope you will also keep an eye out for Sunday School Bonanza, our Gospel Doctrine Rundown podcast, and a Third Hour of Power where we go over the teachings of the presidents of the church or Eliza R. Snow manual someday. Um, where we rock that <laughs> one out with, uh, with This Mormon Life. And, of course, send us an email anytime you want. Contact at thisweekinmormons.com. We always like hearing from you, and we often read your emails on the air when they are so worthy of being broadcast to the world. Uh, Most of the time, they're not. Uh, and of course, Be more witty. And, of course, the last plug, we'd like to thank, once again, Nyland McBain for joining us. Her book is Women at Church, Magnifying LDS Women's Local Impact, and the Mormon Women, Pro Women Project, and which we didn't talk about very much today, but... But the Mormon Women Project. But you can find it at Deseret Book uh, <laughs> online, I believe, at Greg Cofford Books, and also on Amazon if you also want ebooks or the regular one. Did I miss any plugs there? Are we good? Cool. Anytime. All right. See you, everybody. Right, folks. Nylon, thanks again for joining us. We appreciate it. And, folks, this has been another edition of This Week in Mormons. We'll talk to you again soon. Bye bye.